We just here to ask some fundamental questions, my love. This is all about the advanced wave surface, man. Sometimes we need to stretch out a little bit. Sometimes noggins need to, you know, give a little yawn. I, I think I'm in a yawning mode, man. <laughs> I'm going to stretch my bones. We're going to make some stretches <laughs> that are really fundamental at this point, but it might be seen as a stretch if you knew to surf the wave, but to my wave surfers, man, this one's for you. We're going to ask some of those questions that <laughs> stretch our mind bones, that stretch out the possibilities. And, uh, hey, what if, you know, what if, you know what I'm saying? In this investigation, we have to dare to ask the right questions. And these are the questions that people will be afraid to even talk about. Questions like, uh, <laughs> Is Genghis Khan, who here is depicted as a black man, right? In 1883 by the painter V.S. Smirnoff. Okay. Go get it at 4-3-2 the drop. <laughs> Genghis Khan is depicted as a black man. And they got one of the roosters being stabbed to death because he doesn't want to bow down to the shrine of Genghis Khan. Of course, this ain't the real roost. They the iconoclast at the man. Mikael. <laughs> and old Genghis. All right, so one of the questions is, <laughs> one of the questions, man, as we stretch out a little bit, is Genghis Khan Kang. <laughs> this is, is Genghis Khan Kang? Is Kang <laughs> Charles the Fifth? I know, I told y'all. Get ready to stretch your mind, boys, man. Love the real history, WW, man. Holy Roman Emperor Charles the Fifth, right? 1500s, 1558. So we'll be exploring, you know, these type of questions like only we can, you know, in the vibration right here in present John installment number 114. I mean, that's one of the uh, super duper wave surfer questions of the day. I mean, my nog, you think this is play play, man? Just, just, just look at his face. Look deep at his face of old Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. And look at this guy. This guy. <laughs> they made him look real similar, right? Huh? And in this movie, right? Same exact complexion, man. Very similar phenotype. Very similar. <laughs> look at these guys, man. Alright, now this is bringing us back into the Marvel flow, which we'll touch on a little bit today, but. Is it a stretch? Some might think so. <laughs> to talk quantum, to talk time travel. All these uh, seats of survival and the evil eye time travel mechanisms talking about in Marvel. We're going to talk some of this all seeing eyeness. We're going to talk a little Shintamani stone. And Shimbala or Sibola, Sibola, Sibola. Kalelu. All right, so that's one question. <laughs> Is Kang or Ka depicted as a black man? Is he, is he time traveling? <laughs> is this also Charles V? Twelve hundreds, fifteen hundreds, and it's the Marvel depicting Charles V as K, or Khan, who's sitting in this seat of survival, <laughs> time traveling, jamming people up in the timelines. In other words, it's Genghis Khan over there jamming people up in the timelines. Is Khan K? 
Miss Khan Kang. Miss Kang. Charles V. Holy Roman Emperor. Emperor of Rome. You know, what Genghis Khan time travel? You know, let's say, you know, 300 years <laughs> in the future or past. <laughs> Become the Emperor of Rome, Holy Roman Emperor, hijack the Inca, do all that, man, pop off, right? First subsequent European Inca ruler. Hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. Deep thought, right, K? Deep thought, right, homie K? He over there decked out. He got a master fit on, a masterful uh, technological outfit, right? Right. As this is a painting by V.S. Smirnoff in 1883 of a black man, Gangs Khan, right? The black Gangs Khan. He's not, you know, any depiction that they'll normally give us on Google, right? Very slim brother. Psalms 83. Confederacy. Khan. These brothers look just like they people. Right? Look just like they people. They have said, come let us cut them off from being a nation. That the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against you. This, this is taking effect in damn near every timeline on the timeline, right? Biblical timeline, they're confederate against Anabi. It's happening. <laughs> In the 1500s, with Charles Kento hijacking the indigenous Nagas here. It's happening in the 1200s with Genghis Khan. Kang is time, is time traveling all through the timelines, taking on different personas, identities. Genghis Khan is hijacking Prester John in 1200. And they all look like you. Coincidence? No, I think not, my not. I think not. Because they have taken crafty counsel against your people. Who? Other tribes that look like us, right? Verse 5, they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against you, the tabernacles of Edom, the Ishmaelites of Moab, the Hagarines. Yeah. They all look just like us. Edom look like us. Ishmael look like us. Moab, the Hagarines, Gabel, Ammon, Amalek. Yeah, the Philistines look like us too. The children of Lot look like us. So today they fool us and trick us with this black power scenario as if these so-called blacks have ever come together and had some type of black unity when they're fighting each other the whole damn time. So you have the confederate blacks who scream black unity, black pride, black power <laughs> to put you into a black hole so you're not thinking tribal because if you were thinking tribal, you would say, who was invading us? And how do we 
get recompense against they black asses. Before they use the so-called white man as a straw man, it seems like these particular so-called moors are still in power. Because I don't see the war that they went out of power. When did they go out of power, Bo? America's been at war. 93%. We're going to say 103%. And during these Chicago Wars, these first 20 years of Chicago Wars, this is Naga on Naga. Treaties of pieces and friendship right on your head, bro. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against you. <laughs> hmm. Confederate against Anaga. Even as recent as the 18th century into the 19th century, where you have the Tecumse War. And Tecumse was fighting in the Shikamago Wars led by Dragon Canoe. Right? You got the Barbary, which are the Swan Knights. Because Barbar means Swan. We don't talk Swan Knights, Kalelu, Sylvanus, to Texas. War of 1812. Bang. The last great turning point of the Hebrews. As the Kumse was rallying the Hebrew tribes and not all of the Eber rules, not all of our people wanted to fight against the tyranny of the treaties of this invasion of Psalms 83. So what happened? It appears that this Tecumse flow was our last great documented stand and we were still fighting each other. They were fighting against the Choctaw in them, right? At that time, who else? <laughs> Everybody outside these, you know, making these treaties, you know what I'm saying? Uh, doing everything to solidify their personal security, but not securing the whole pie, right? Tecumseh wants to secure the whole pie, the whole tribe. These tribal leaders, you know, out of fear, you know, out of what they were considering wisdom, you know, hey, I can't fight this invasion, let me make a deal. Right? And after that, the wars continue. All these wars, Seminole Creek, Texas, Indian, Monaco, the Car and Kahawa. Invading Mexico, that's still us, man. <laughs> All these are Naga wars. The Philippines, you already know, these are dark skinned copper colored Nagas. Hawaii, Kama, Kamahamaha, <laughs> Kamayamai. All that flow was within that Philippine flow. Until you get to World War II and the Cold War, Korean War and all that, right? But supposedly that's about international, this, this, and that. All the wars up until clearly 1940s and 50s were all Naga War. And in many cases, Naga on Naga because they were using these Nagas that already had a gripe with the children of Israel right here at home, the promised land, those that were covetous of the promised land, they were fighting against the home team, man. They were 
fighting against the Kunsei, against Dragon Canoe, against the Shikamaru, against the Seminole, against the Creek. Shawnee, Pawnee, the Swans. That's just some recent history, man. Of the last great stand. Talking Hebrew rules, we'll get back to it, right? So let's go. The other fundamental question we like to ask uh, for the advanced wave surfers <laughs> is uh, is Moses David? Is David Moses? Is did the Christian flow, did they separate David from his <laughs> uh, immortal priesthood, uh, you know, supernatural, everything you're going to get out of, you know, the Prester investigation, <laughs> the dragons, the this and that. That's why we got to go back in Numbers 21, talk about this copper dragon flow. Is David Moses. I mean, let's think about the similarities. Uh, both of them come from a sinless father, Amram and Jesse, right? Both of them fighting giants, you know what I'm saying? Both of them are both king and priests. David's anointed one shepherd. Interesting combination. We're going to get back in. The Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, Qumran text, prophecy of Joshua, who's prophesying about King David returning. And you see the connection there when you just, you know, pontificate. You know, it seems like the Presta investigation is a perfect blend of combination between the David character and, and, and all of its light, you know, and all of its... Um, possibilities you know what i'm saying when we start seeing clearly and the moses flow you know what i'm saying uh, the shepherd type of flow you know what i'm saying and then we keep reading about how david is the one shepherd forever so there's a shepherd connection they're both from sinless men they're both fighting giants it's worth looking at the parallels between moshe and joshua in an extra biblical type of sense you know outside of what they give us in the canonized versions What's this connection? Especially with the book of Jashir, we'll get that quickly, you know. We get we're gonna get a lot of things quickly just to tie in as much as we can, but you know, the book of Jashir talks about Moses being the king of Kush for forty years, so we'll definitely connect that. So those are two big, big questions, you know. Um of course we got from that thorough good book a long time ago, they got two two major fundamental questions they wanna know in the academia world in the scholarship world their two greatest questions man is what happened <laughs> to the lost tribes of israel where'd you go right where are you now and where did the american indians originate from <laughs> and so those are the two biggest questions in academia real talk where did the lost tribes of israel go and where did you know how this come from <laughs> in America. And you put up, you put all that together and you say, oh, they're the same people and they're the people that we have um, been massacring, putting into captivity, genocide to this day. So you put all that together, yeah, these are the same Nagas. The Lost Tribes of Israel are the Amarokans, are the copper colored so-called Negroes found in America in India Superior, and there will be payback for what you've done to the children of Israel. We've had to, we've had to endure. Hasharala had to endure Jacob's trouble. We're still going through it, but the hijack, that recompense, you can't pay that back, man. You can't pay back what you've done to the Kumsei. You can't pay back these treaties. These treacherous Naga treaties on the head bone of Tecumse. All the death that occurred because you didn't want to side with the real one. You wanted to side with the hijack. You 
You know how much bloodshed is on your hands? Loud one. You know, another great question. You know, other than Moses, David connection, this Kang, <laughs> this uh, Kang flow connected with this Charles flow connected with this Khan flow. And of course, the fact that Kang and Preston seen them if I seem to be having their beef <laughs> in the story of Marvel with Preston John <laughs> yeah, he's a Marvel character right yeah we know what he looked like see how they tried to hijack him yeah, yeah he, he he's gaining this evil eye right this evil eye we clicked on this before it's technology and it gives him the ability to see clearly and that's what we get went back to dragon etymology to see clearly right and his eye connects to this stone called the shintamani stone kentamani stone we'll do a dismount off for sure the evil eye is made of an unknown metal sounds like the alchemy flow right the dragon is of an unknown substance it's mysterious it is capable of manipulating matter at the molecular molecular level, firing concussive force blasts, disintegrating matter, nullifying other energy. So it nullifies other energy sources. And creating or destroying force fields. So whatever spell they putting on it or not. Whatever 5G yada yada, <laughs> this so called evil high. So clearly, it's not evil to us, it's evil to the hijack. The same way the hijack would call the dragons evil and relate our dragons to the devil, right? Demons and this, they'll call us savages. It's the same thing with this technology. Now, this evil eye possesses dimensional time travel ability. And Kang was trying to get this evil eye, right? So it said it burst into pieces, it exploded. And they will be pushed through the earth until the they met sunlight again. So it's a battle to put this back together. This technology that has time travel abilities come, come, come. so did Kong Kang have any connection with this technology and is this how they got the evil eye or is this how he started popping off his time travel truck? Things that make you go. Hmm. And what does this evil eye have to do with the Shintamani stone? All right. Go. Here we go. You know, they they try, y'all. They try, man. They've been trying for you. We got patient knockers over here, man. <laughs> 
We'll let the legs load up. It's all good. Hi, right, Jack. We ain't gonna throw our flow off, man. <laughs> so they're calling it the evil eye. They're saying he has some type of time travel connection. We're calling it the one with the deadly glance. Because <laughs> in etymology, the deadly glance is the dragon. We're keeping the dragons in play because, you know, it seems to be all about the fire, the water, the ether. All about the earth. This technology, they said, was split into six parts. Buried throughout, you know, the earth. Did Kang have some of this tech, man? This is what we're exploring. Reload. To see clearly, to see, I have seen the one with the deadly glass. Got it. Okay, okay, okay. Another great question is regarding this uh, Miriam flow. Her mother's name, they say it is Anna. Last time I said, oh, okay, is, is that <laughs> Lady Hannah, right? We've been talking about Lady Hannah, mother, or uh, wife of Preston John, and they have a son. David, Exalark, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, these are these are the cons, you know what I'm saying, that at this time are going to head up with Genghis Khan and Kang and all that. So, the infamous cons, you know, this King David is almost as, you know, infamous or popular as his father did, you know, Preston John. He is also a Preston John. Okay, so. Alright, so other than the David Moses connection, other than the King uh, Charles V connection, time travel, and evil eye, and Marvel flow. <laughs> Not entertained, we're talking present time. Let's look at it from a lady dragon on a wall perspective again. Let's recon Hannah. Let's see where it takes us. Aqua. We touched on this. Go get the drop and press the John 113. Miriam of the Quran, right? And they start talking new tests because of the reflections, the phantoms. And who is picking out the phantom? The Quran is picking out the phantom. The Quran is saying, hey, yeah, this is Mary. They say they still say mother of Isa, right? They don't say Jesus. They say Isa. The Christians interpret that as this Jesus thing, right? And then, but the Quran, this ain't no crucifixion Jesus, hero Jesus. No, nah, they, they got their own hero. Muhammad's the hero. But they do say that this Miriam is the mother of this Jesus or Isa, but she's also the sister of Aaron or Haran and the daughter of Anna and Imran. The daughter of Anna, right? And they're saying, yeah, that, that has more to do with the non-canonical parallels. Meaning the parts that were taken out, the Bible, the apocryphal stuff, you know, the secret stuff. That connects more with the real, or at least the version of Miriam in the Quran. Instead of the Mary-Jesus situation in Christianity, you got a Miriam... And Isa or Joshua flow. 
Now, who's going to take it a step further and say, oh, Joshua, like Moses' Joshua? Yeah, that new test, straight up hijack. A lot of new written history, right? They rewrote the story. Parallels, phantoms, duplication. Yosef Durrell done dug on so many great duplications reading, uh, taking it all, all the way home that Caesar's Messiah flow. We always appreciate you, brother Yosef, for that. And Come on, man. I mean, these are more parallels, man, right? So the non-canonical parallels to this Miriam flow, it's clearly making it very clear that Mary is the sister of Moses, right? The sister of Aaron, the daughter of Huck. Amram or Imram, right? Right here it says in Miriam's birth in the Quran, Miriam is described most likely symbolically as the daughter of Amram, a common ancestor for the prophets. In the Quranic story, Miriam's barren mother, Anna, is longing for an end to her reproach among women. When the time comes for the child to be born, her mother, surprised that she is a girl, nonetheless fulfills her promise and dedicates her to the temple service. So, similar to a Jesus Mary New Testament, except this Mary is Mary M. Moses' sister, man. See, the Christians aren't going to connect. Oh, that's Moses' sister who has Jesus because that, that takes away all of their newfound history. All right? That takes away all of their syncretinous, syn syncretic paganism that they're bringing in, idol worship they're bringing in. It wasn't no one worshiping this Isa. This, this was a prophet. And they still are hiding something under the rug in the Quran flow because they had to make room for Muhammad to be the hero. But there's a quiet veneration for this Miriam, and it's a quiet honoring of this Isa. But what if we're just talking Joshua, right? Look, we yawn and we're making a big stretch, right? <laughs> My wave servers know. So, you know, as we serve the wave and 114, we're going to connect some of this uh, Miriam, Mary, really dig on the Anna Hannah. And keep our David Moshe comparisons in mind. And keep our Cain, Con, Charles V comparisons in mind. Like only we can as we surf the wave and drop nation. So who's Anna? Let's have some fun. Who's Anna? Miriam's mother is Anna, right? Now remember, there is a lady Hannah. Remember, there is a lady Hannah. Because Exilarch David the Sixth saw in Babylon and Georgia. Oh, yeah, we coming home with the Georgia history. Georgia on my mind. Son of Raja Heraja Chola the Second. Jaron. Preston John. Preston John is the husband of Lady Hannah. Come. Lady Hannah. Wife of the Preston is the mother 
the mother of David, the ex of Lot. Okay. Sosli. Now here it just lists her also as the mother of Hanan or Canaan, Jewish king of Tahama. Solomon, Solomon, Jewish king of Telmas. There is a Tahama, California. Shout out to the Aqua who uh, dropped that. <laughs> so these are all kings, right? David the sixth, Saul of Babylon. Gotcha. So she's the mother of all these kings, right? Also sons of the Preston. Now what about her daughters, right? <laughs> Just keep all this in mind because they won't give it to you in one swipe. You got to search for it in different ways, right? So that's Lady Hannah of Babylon, wife of Preston Cha. This is Lady Hannah, <laughs> Queen of Tahama, right? <laughs> He wondered how Hanan can be king of Tahama. His mama is queen of Tahama, which is why her son Hanan is king of Tahama. Let's go. <coughs> right, Shalak. Instead of saying um, wife of Preston John, it says David the first. You see all these titles, right? This David the first, king of Rubadi, God Imani. It's like saying king of Judah, and Judah is has the scepter or is in rulership over these other tribes of Israel as well, by order, right? So the king of Judah would also be the king of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. Now this time, right, Hannah isn't just listed with having the sons Hanan and David and Solomon. Hannah now is showing she's having daughters, right? Mother of Princess Dara of her body, God Imani. Hannah the second, so there's Hannah again. And Princess Limbu. <laughs> Everybody got him body. So keep all this in mind. We're talking Hannah. Is this the same Anna? All right. We're we're yawning. We're making a stretch, man. It's a victory lap. Is this the same Anna that is the mother of Miriam, Moses, and Aaron? Is that a stretch? Okay. Let's look for more uh, recon. Let's, let's let's get some more evidence, right? This is an investigation. We need evidence. We need evidence, man. I guess the thing about it is, if based on the Quran, the Quranic story, Marion's barren mother, Anna, <coughs> who was barren, she has... Miriam now. Is that her only child? Is that just her first child? That makes Miriam the oldest? Okay. Moses' big sister, right? Okay. Let's look for some, um, you know, name meetings and stuff, right? So, Uh, okay, check it out. Anna, feminine name given from Latin form of the Greek Ava, A V V A, which is what? Awa or Hawa, uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> huh, okay. Reminds me of an Eve type of flow, right? Eve, uh, who's also Kawa or Hawa or Awa, would also probably be called Anna. But I ain't, I ain't stretching that far yet. <laughs> Is Anna Eve, man? <laughs> Is Moses' mother Eve, man? All right, man. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going there yet, but I am talking Anna. All right. Anna is the Hebrew name. But well, the Hebrew name is Hannah, right?
And I told you how they be putting them C's and K's in front of the H's. So sometimes you got Canaan or Kanan or Hanan. Hanan, right? I said choose your Canaan because there's more than one Canaan, right? So when they say these are Canaanites, sometimes it's a trick because they're not talking about that Hamitic Canaan. They're talking about Hanan or Ania, sons of Hannah. Anna, Lady Anna, Anna, right, mother of Solomon, Hanan, and David, King David, Exilarch the Six. <clears throat> we got it before. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just popping off. All right, so. Hana, right? It's sometimes spelled with a C in front of it, or a CH, or a K, or a Q. All that is possible in the magical uh, <laughs> world of language. So K's and Q's are interchangeable. C, CH's. Sometimes I take it all off, and it's just Hana, just like the Anna flow. This Hana is the son of Lady Hannah. And even in the alternative flow, Hannah also has a son, Hannah. Put it together, all right? Who is the son of David the first? And since this David is married to Hannah, right? And since this married this this Hannah is married to this David here, now he's being called. Now he's being called Preston John. I can't make this stuff. This is genie. Talking genealogies. Okay, okay. 1195. Remember, Genghis Khan came to war against him in 1202. Or are we just talking about? <laughs> okay. Huh? Huh? Traveling the timelines. Keep it in mind. Keep it in your mind, Bo. Or are we just talking about old Charlesy boy? Old Charles Kento. Holy Roman Emperor Charles. And. So we've established what? That Anne Anna is Hannah. And the meaning is favor, grace, beautiful. So the aqua that Preston John is married to, Lady Hannah of Babylon, because you're in Babylonian captivity, these are excellent. Her name means beautiful, right? Her name means beautiful. Miriam's mother, Moshe's mother, Aaron's mother, Anna is Hannah, whose name means beautiful, right? Okay. Now, here's the $64 million question. In the Bible, Moses' mother, her name is, how do you say, Jokbet? Jokbet? Jokbet, J-O-C-H-E-B-E-B. E D, which they say in Hebrew is like a Yo Yav, Yav Kevet or something like that. And the Yad or the Yud means what to worship, right? And what does that Jok Bed mean?
Jock Bad, all right, from JWA.org. Jock Bad, wife of Amron, mother of Moshe, Aaron, Miriam, right? So in Islam, they got Moses's or Miriam, you know, all their mother is Hannah or Anna. In the Bible, it's Jock Bad, right? Jock Bad. Now, these are titles. What is her name name? Is it Hannah <laughs> or is it Jock Bay, right? Interesting questions. <laughs> um, who has it right? <laughs> the Bible or the Quran, right? Or are they just giving titles, meanings of who this Aqua is? Because she definitely is being honored in the Quran. Is Anna, Hannah, synonymous with Jokbe, right? So, mention only, by name only in Exodus 6, verse 20, and Numbers 26, 59. Both genealogical listings. Jokbed, whose name Hebrew in Hebrew is Yav Kevin, or Chaved, or Chawa. I mean, the V's of W's, right? <laughs> and then later they say apparently means Yod, apparently, right? They don't know. They don't know. Yod Hevav, right? So that's the tetragrammaton flow. Now, they want to say uh, this divine element of Yah. <laughs> and all they're doing is getting the Yud. And the Yud, which means worship, right? And the name meaning, they said, is glory. So, is the Yah because of, oh, that's the name of the creator, it's Yah. Or is it? symbolizing glory and worship which is what the yud or yad is in picto paleo hebrews worship worship of what hawa the worship of hawa is glory notable as the first person in the bible to have the name with the divine element yah a shortened form yeah. Hey. Wow. Hey. All right. So you got the Quran version of it, then you got the Bible version of it, right? Uh, Tanakh version. Jock bed, wife of Amram, mother of Moses, Aaron, Miriam, mentioned by name only. Exodus six twenty, Numbers twenty six fifty nine. And geneal genealogical list. Amron took into his house, house household as wife his father's sister Jochebed. Interesting. And she bore him Aaron and Moses, and the span of Amron's life was 137 years. Okay. Keeping it close to home. <laughs> Jock bed. It's mentioned in Exodus 6 and Numbers 26. The name of Aaron's wife, Jock bed, daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt. She bore to Amram, Aaron, Moses, and their sister Mary. Okay. So who's right? Who's right? Why is glory, right? That's so Jogbite Jogbe means the glory. Hawa's glory. Anna means beautiful grace, favor, right? Anna. So you see this glory and this grace and this favor and this beautiful. Those are the titles of the names Hana and the Yav Kewe or Yakevav or Jogbe. <laughs> So, just taking it a step further, these are the meanings of their names, right? The favor, the grace, the beauty, and with the junk bed, the, the glory, the glory, all right? 
I'll check it out. It says Anna is in wide use in countries across the world. Variants Anne, Anna, or French version, English speaking countries. And Anne, which is originally the English spelling, Saint Anne is traditionally the name of the mother of the Virgin Mary. Whoa. Whoa, 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 right? Because we got here on one hand. I mean, this is the biggest mystery. <laughs> one of the biggest mysteries of all time, man. So, on one hand, Miriam's mother was bearing named Anna in the Quran. Okay. This is what the story is going down. <laughs> Miriam, sister of Aaron and Moses, was bearing. She has the Isa, right? <laughs> and he's being kind of uh, downplayed in the Quran from that point on. Hannah, right? Now, they have a phantom parallel duplication in the New Testament. With someone you probably never heard of named Saint Anne. All right. So Anne is the saint who is supposed to be the mother of the Virgin Mary. Parallels. <laughs> Did you know that the Virgin Mary's mother is Anne? Anne Miriam in the Quran. Mother is also Anne. Except the Miriam in the Quran is the sister of Moses, the daughter of Amram, the perfect man who bore Moses. Come on, you got to make it make sense. The Quran was very specific, is very specific that this is Moses' sister, right? Aaron's sister, whose mother is Anne. Then the New Testament got... The Virgin Mary now with Jesus, not Joshua, Jesus, right? And her mother is also Anne, and now they're calling her Saint Anne. And Saint Anne, according to Christian Apocryphal, right? Because now you got to get into the non canonicals, right? As this link which is telling us stmaron.org likewise there have been some attempts to compare the Quranic references to Mary to some of the non canonical writings that would be the apocryphal apocryphal writings right? to the writings rejected by the Christian church. That's the only way you're going to see clearly is if you look at the writings that were rejected by the early Christian church. And the writings that are rejected by the early Christian church seem to be matching up with this Miriam understanding in the Quran that the sister of Moses, the sister of Aaron, is the Mary who has Joshua. And if that's the case, then Joshua is the nephew of Moshe, which explains why Moses lays his hands on him in Deuteronomy 34, passes his his uh, you know great energy, and Joshua starts popping off, parting the waters from the waters, stopping the sun, stopping the moon in its tracks, makes the sun stand still, <laughs> pauses the waterfalls, like he goes crazy. Defeats giants. He goes crazy. Right. So let's go. So let's get back to Anne for a minute. Right. Saint Anne is the mother of the Virgin Mary. And here's this barren mother virgin. Virgin Mary bearing mother, right? <laughs> Who has Mary? Mary, um, not Mary and Jesus.
in the Surah Maryam, the Quranic chapter which describes the events of Maryam's conception, birth, service in the temple, as well as the birth of Esau, right? Not Jesus, right? This is just another title for this pure child, you know what I'm saying? Which is a Joshua, which is Quetzalcoatl, right? <laughs> so she's Quetzalcoatl's mama, right? She's the rainbow dragon's mama, right? These are lady dragons on the wall. Miriam is called the sister of Aaron. That can't be a mistake. But then they try to say, oh, we're just saying that that she was a relative <laughs> in the genealogies of Aaron. She's the sister of Aaron, man. She's the daughter of Imran. This seeming impossibility was employed by the early Christians in their apologetics as proof that the prophet Muhammad was confused between Miriam, sister of Moses and Aaron, whose father was Amram, the Quranic Imram, and the Mary of the New Testament. Was Muhammad confused? Oh, <laughs> Or do they have us, uh, have we caught them red-handed, man? Did they have us in the crux, man? Issa, the son of Miriam, right? Associating him with his prophetic lineage. Yeah, let's talk about Moses. Let's talk David. But right now, we're still talking Anna. Anna. <laughs> Which means grace. Favor. She has favor. Hannah has favor. Beautiful. So now you know there's a Saint Anne. Alright. Recon this, man. This is just researching. Who's supposed to be the mother of the Virgin Mary? Come on, man. And there's multiple Marys, right? There's like three Marys. <laughs> Some break down this, <clears throat> you know, um, this three Mary situation that this Anna uh, is the mother of three different Marys. Like she got married three times and she had three different Marys. <laughs> or are they stretching it? And, uh, and can we use those three Marys and bring them into one Mary? You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'll start the process today, but this is something that got to continue and press the 115 for sure. Because we got some things to talk about. All right. Don't discount Samuel, by the way. <clears throat> don't discount Sam. The story is similar to that of Samuel, whose mother, Hannah, right? Another Anna. Right? Who's Samuel? He's the one that put David on, right? He's the one that Hawaii used to anoint David, right? Okay, We're talking first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. Go get it. So the story is similar to that of Samuel, whose mother, Hannah, had also been childless. Another parallel. What's up with Samuel? <laughs> The Immaculate Conception was eventually made dogma by the Catholic Church. So this Immaculate Conception of childless, barren birth was present with the Miriam situation. Miriam and Hannah, Anna, Hannah, as well as Samuel the prophet. Following an increased devotion to Anne in the 12th century. Why? Because it's all happening in the 1100s, man. This devotion to Anne in the 12th century would be symbolic with, I don't know, Lady Hannah, Hannah of Babylon. This is 12th century. Are they tying all this together? The wife of Preston John is Hannah. And they're saying she's being honored or venerated in the 12th century. Well, yeah, she's the wife of Preston John. <laughs> Unless you're not tying in the David Moshe connection, which are both titles as well. 
Lady Hannah, Queen of Tahama. Managa, 12th century. Hannah, Hannah. Mother of the Virgin Mary, mother of Mary, mother of Samuel, who's supposed to be childless as well and barren, right? Then they get the Immaculate Conception, make it dogma in the Catholic Church, following an increased devotion to Hannah in the 12th century, dedications to Hannah or Anne in Eastern Christianity occur as early as 6th century in Eastern Orthodox tradition, Anne and Joachim are ascribed the title Ancestors of Gods. Whoa. Okay. Ancestors of God, right? Anne. Why? Because she's the Virgin Mary's mama? Or are we just talking about the mother of Moses, who the Bible will call Joke, bad. <laughs> and we got to see, you know, what's, what's, is there a connection with Joke, bad in the Bible, mother of Moses, and Hannah, mother of Moses, Aaron, and Mary in the Quran? God, God. I mean, this is uh, <laughs> mind blasting. Is there a connection with Joke, bad, and Hannah? Now that we see uh, all this connectivity they're making, you know, mother, ancestor, God, which has nothing to do with J.C., everything to do with Moses, everything to do with Mary. And in, the, in Islam, revered in Islam, right? Revered in Islam. Recognized as a highly spiritual woman, as a mother of Mary. She is not named in the Quran where she is referred to as the wife of Imra. But we just got that. She's named as Anna or Hannah, right? The Quran describes her remaining childless until old age. One day, Hannah saw a bird feeding its young while sitting in the shade of the tree, which occurred or which awakened her desire to have children of her own. She prayed for a child and eventually conceived. Her husband, Imram, died before the child was born, expecting the child to be male. Hannah vowed to dedicate him to isolation and service in the second temple. However, Hannah bore a daughter instead and named her Mary. Right. With the Samuel flow, uh, Samuel was born and he was dedicated <laughs> to the temple, right? <laughs> wow. See, that's all right. Okay. Okay. Her words upon de delivering Mary reflected her status as a great mystic. So her words upon delivering Mary reflect her status as a great mystic. <laughs> what does that mean? Huh? Realize, are we just talking about a marvel? Realizing that while she had wanted a son, this daughter was God's gift to her. Then when she brought forth, she said, My Lord, truly, I brought her forth a female, and God is greater in knowledge of what she brought forth. And the male is not like the female, so her Lord received her with the very best acceptance, and her bringing forth caused the very best to develop in her. So we got these three Marys, man. Now it says ancient belief attested to by a sermon of John of Damascus was that Anne married once. All right, so that's the ancient belief she married once. In the late Middle Ages, legend had held that Anne was married three times. So ancient belief says she was married once. 
Then in the late Middle Ages, here comes this new story saying, oh, no, nah, she was married three times to really attack her character, attack her her chasteness, right? You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, they, they have to probably try to throw some smut on Mary, right? So here's their theory as of the late Middle Ages, which will be 1300 to 1500 AD. So this is after the 1100, 12th century, things changed towards the three, 1300s to 1500s. And my bad, I mean, who's the Holy Roman Emperor in the 1500s? Oh, yeah. Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, 1500 to 1558. So people that look just like us were changing we're throwing smut on our ancestors, our queens, right? To try to make things real difficult for us to trace back to reality. So the new story became, uh, she was married three times, first to Jokchin, Jokchin. Then to Clopas, and finally to a man named Solimas. <laughs> We're talking about Hannah and Solimas. And here we talking about Hannah and Solimas, or here just called the Emperor of <laughs> Soli, Prester John. Hannah. All right, we're going to connect this Hannah. And this joke bag, right? So we just so breezing through these three marriages. So you have <laughs> so the story is that she got instead of marrying one, she married three, three, three different uh, individuals. Joke time, joke chin, J O A C H I M. Uh, then to Clopa, C L. O P A S. Then to Soli, right? <laughs> and my theory is you put them all together, you probably they're all probably the same people, man. So the theory is that in each marriage they produce one daughter. And all these daughters were named Mary. Now I'm not a I'm not a gambling man, but what's the odds, man? What what's the statistics? What's the odds that this Highly revered Lady Hannah, mother of Miriam, Mo Moses and Aaron, had two other previous husbands, and each of those, from her being barren, right, <laughs> she produces one daughter in each of those three marriages, and each time they named the daughter Mary. I went. I'm not a gambling man or a betting man. Tell me the odds that she will have one child with you, with each of them, have a daughter, and all of them name is Mary. So now you got this Miriam or Mary, mother of Jesus, or Issa or Miriam, right? This is now we in the you know Christianity world, so it's all about JC, right? So Mary, mother of JC, Mary of Clopas. And marry Salome. And Salome is what? Salima, right? Shalom, right? Okay. <laughs> the sister of St. Anne was so be, mother of Elizabeth. So you know, I'm, I'm going quick, man. This is crazy, man. So you got the three Marys. You got Salome in the New Testament. She a follower of J.C. Apparently appears briefly in the canonical gospels and the apocryphal, right? Non-canonical. She's named by Mark as present at the crucifixion. One of the mirror, mirth bearers, right? And this mirth and Mary has a connection by itself. Mirth, joy, right? Mary, uh, Miriam. The women who found Jesus' empty tomb. So it's all about JC and worshiping JC. Yada yada yada. You know, we're gonna get 
deeper on it, but you know, again, Salome means shalom. Are these all the same Marys? You got Mary of Clopas. According to the Gospel of John, Mary of Clopas, okay, one of the women present at the crucifixion. So all of them happened, all the Marys were present at the crucifixion of JC. Y'all buying that? Mary, mother of JC, Mary of Salome, Mary of Cl all three Marys were present at the crucifixion. <laughs> What's the odds of this, right? Oh, man. So, you see, we got a lot more to look into. This is Presto 114, and we're barely getting started. How we doing on time? Because we about to go in, in bone. And this, this is probably some of the most fun I've had digging on this, man. So, I ain't going to make this like a three-hour drop, but you know, I'm going to try to keep these around the two-hour mark going forward. I know that's a lot of information in one sitting for, the, for my Nagas. And I got my 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 real ones that like them three, four-hour drops, you know what I'm saying? So once in a while, my Nagas, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best, all right, because we got plenty to talk about. So that's just a little intro on the three Marys, right? Miriam or in the New Testament, uh, the Virgin Mary, right? Then you got Mary of Clopas and Salome Mary, and all three of them are present at the crucifixion. Now, thinking back to this Jock Bed situation, Jock Bed, right? Mother of Moses in the Bible. Great link from Marquette.edu. And before we just, you know, move on from some of this Merriam flow, let's, let's just see if we can find a hard hit that can connect the biblical joke bed mother of Miriam to the Quran, Hannah Anna, mother of Miriam. You know what I mean? See what we got here. Okay, 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 okay. I'm just surfing away with my noggins, seeing what we got. So they're going in a little bit on some parallel flow. I like it. Oh man, are you see, oh, come on, man. Y'all, y'all caught this yet? I'm just belly flopping, but did you catch this yet? I'm just gonna jump right in. So it says, "What of Samuel?" All right, page 150. This is called the New Moses, a Matthian typology. Research what a typology is. Yosef done broke it down many times in the ether at 432thedrop.com. Ether squad. Typologies, you know, it's, it's literally duplications, you know what I'm saying? Areas that they are uh, trying to replicate real solid factual history, but into another package, you know, into a reflection, into a phantom, right? So let's just pick it up. We're talking typologies. We just talked about Samuel, right? Okay, let's pick it up right there. 
What if Samuel, his mother Hannah, was barren because the Lord had closed her womb? First Samuel chapter 1 verse 5. And only in response to prayer was she open. So this Hannah, just like Miriam Anna Hannah, just like Jokbed. Moreover, quote, that also Jokbed and Hannah were felt to be parallel cases is proved by the fact that Hannah too, like Jokbed, is said to have been 130 years of age when she conceived Samuel. And Samuel's birth has clearly been a model for the miraculous birth of Mary in the Protovangelium Jacobi. <laughs> Y'all got that? I mean, that's just a little snippet, but it sure is saying a lot. That the Samuel flow might play more than we think. But even if we're just talking Miriam and Hannah, that flow, you're talking about a barren mother. And Samuel's birth clearly has been a model for this miraculous birth of Miriam herself. Because Hannah had Miriam, right? And then you have Hannah having Samuel. Has some type of miraculous conception situation. Then you got some New Testament Mary and Jesus situation. All that without even talking about you no know, uh, uh, Egyptian, you know, mythos. You know, I'm saying Horus and <laughs> all that virgin birth Horus situation, right? So whether we're talking the Zeus flow, <laughs> I mean, whether we're talking about you know just strictly in the script, there's parallels to this immaculate conception starting really at the Samuel flow. I mean, really shit, going to the Moshe flow, you know what I'm saying, the Hannah flow, you know what I'm saying, with the Miriam flow, you know what I mean? And they too are seeing the parallel with this Hannah character and Jockbed character. And that's very interesting because we are asking the same question. What is this Jockbed flow? have to do with Hannah Anna, right? And if she's the mother of Miriam, that means that she is also titled Hannah or Glory. God. Or Shalot, Grace, Favor, Beauty. Jokbed comes out to glory. And this is a glorious connection with this Jokbed and Hannah having been 130 years of age when she conceived. So Jokbed popped off Miriam at that age. And she was dedicated to the temple. And Hannah pops off Samuel at that age, and he's dedicated <laughs> to the temple, right? Okay. Things that make you go, hmm. <laughs> it's my humla. He's thinking about the same damn thing. <laughs> Kang is thinking about about the same damn thing. But we're just talking Charles, you boy. We're just talking Charles, you boy. Kyle. Kyle. We're just talking Charles, you boy. Things that make you go, hmm. Is Jock Bed or Glory the same as Hannah, Anna, or Grace, Favor? Beautiful. I mean, is it beautiful? To praise the glory of the most high power. Is that. Is it beautiful? Is it graceful? You know. To have the glory of the most high. 
is the glory of the Most High, grace unto you, beauty unto you. Same aqua, barren, 130 years, pops off. <laughs> Anna, revered, revered in Islam. Hmm. Is Moses David? Hmm. Yeah. Is Cain Khan? Hmm. Yeah, we got a lot of. We just taking a nice yawn, a nice wake up stretch. Love to the Khan veteran. Uh, we just taking a, a wake up stretch. Yeah, we just taking a wake up stretch. Love to veteran. Ah, uh, cause Kang is looking for the evil eye. Uh, Evil eye made of an unknown metal. Alchemical dragon. Mysterious substance, substance of unknown origin. So the evil eye is made of an unknown metal. Dragon is a substance, mysterious substance of unknown origin, unknown metal, unknown origin. The vessel, the vessel in which the Ruach is contained. Back to the dragon bodies, right? <laughs> Serpents of wisdom flow. Gotcha. Hmm. After the Crusades, John traveled the world. Preston John traveled the world until he was found. He found the island of Avalon where he gained this technology, time travel, to see clearly. Because if you have the evil eye, then you are the one with the deadly glance. Do you see clearly? Seeing clearly is considered the evil eye to them. The evil eye. The new technologies and Got me thinking about the Shintamani stone as a piece of technology that was helping Naga see clearly for a long time since there's stories about it in the Hindu, stories about it connected with Shambhala. The all-seeing eye, right? <laughs> I can't make it up. All seeing eye, eye of providence had already been assembled. The founding fathers incorporated into the great seal, right? So now you got that, you know, Egyptian pyramid eye thing, but they are already connecting that before that <laughs> to what's called the Shintamani stone. They say it was brought to earth by Syrian, Syrian missionaries or people from Syria's constellation so before it was just a symbol it's a stone it's technology man who may have possessed this rare stone while well, skeptics about the very existence of the same mind, and we cannot dispute the fact that references can be found in ancient literature. We also have to wonder why are myths and legends emanating from
from so many other nations and tribes about this highly prized gem. Why? It has something to do with time travel, boss. <laughs> a common suggestion is that the Centimani was a gift for the series star systems millions of years ago. Okay, okay. Galactic, Galactic Federation, Galactic Super Wave when a planet orbiting Sirius A exploded. Didn't they say this evil eye exploded into six different parts? Some of these fragments reach Earth after, after traveling through space because these stones are so rare. It is said that only a few people have possessed it. King Solomon, Alexander the Great, Akbar. <laughs> but could the Tintamani found in Eastern lore be a part of the Philosopher's Stone? Right? And Managa, the Philosopher's Stone? Has everything to do with the alchemical dragon. Has everything to do with this philosophical quicksilver? The dragon is prepared by the phil philosopher's venom. <laughs> we're talking about renewal we're talking about power we're talking about water this philosopher's venom has everything to do with the philosopher's stone renewal right power <laughs> so the Sintamani stone is a symbol of the philosopher's stone or the philosopher's venom back to the power back to the renewal right Philosopher Stone <laughs> connects with the Sentimani. And the Sentimani has everything to do with Shambhala. <laughs> nah, the hijack couldn't find Shambhala. The hijack couldn't find Sibol, right? But these are different flags. That was supposed to represent the Sintamani stone. The banner of peace. Some say he received it from the League of Nations after it failed to establish a peaceful new, wor new world order. Why it was given to him has also been questioned. Although there is no denying that. They got a powerful political ally. We're talking about Nicholas Rourke, 1931. That's the same time they were uh, G G E Kincaid's cracking in the Grand Canyon, finding artifacts in the Grand Canyon in the 30s, right? Okay. They're talking about it in the Czech Republic. <laughs> The Sintamani is thought to consist of Moldavite, a glass created with a large meteor. Uh-oh. What's a meteor? It's a presser. <laughs> it's a dragon. Let's go. The emerald tablet, which contained the alchemical instructions for transmutation associated with the creation of the Philosopher's Stone, is thought to be made of Moldavite. Anybody got this, some of that Moldavite drop, man? Go holler at CJ Battle, man. <laughs> natural by law, you got some of that motivate, man. Go, go hit him naturalbylaw.net, man. The Buddhist got a whole thing on a Sintamani flow, you know what I'm saying? The Vedic legends got this whole drop. They got this Naga King connection with the Sintamani stone. Wish fulfilling gem, so they say, Oh man, not only does it do time travel, this evil eye, right? <laughs> this all seeing eye, but it grants wishes too. The 
The jewel first appeared as one of the seven treasures owned by a king who was benevolent. Remember, they said King Solomon had to drop. So if King Solomon had to drop, King David had to have to drop. The Presta had to drop, man. Here's the stories as a water purifying crystal. Oh, you could drop it in that water, get that pure water, that mem sauce, which could be placed in murky waters by traveling monks. So they got that pure water. Amazing, right? We're just talking Sentimani stone. Long sought by treasure hunters. Captured the imagination of man throughout the ages as tales of his wish fulfilling jewel had spread around the world. So just as Prester was huge, Crusades popped off because of this Prester, so, so is the lore around the treasures of Prester, around the treasures, you know, in India Superior, right? The Dragon Flow, the Philosopher's Stone, the Philosopher's Venom. Talking alchemy. Talking the drag. God. Bring it back, bring it back. So you remember the numbers of 21, right? <laughs> We're still talking dragons. We talked about the fiery and biting, go get the drive, how bite is a sting, and it's the the breath that is a the sting of the fire from the Moses uh, makes a copper dragon, not a brass snake, that breathes on you. And that stinging of the fire, stinging of the breath, purified a not. It gave you life, right? Numbers 21, right? It gave you life. Did the snake bite you and you got life? <laughs> or did the breath give you life? And can we connect that breath to... Even the mythos of dragons, you know, um, the, the healing property of dragons. Are there any mythos that connect dragon breath with healing properties, right? So, you know, back to the Moses brazen serpent uh, as it relates to serpent worship, they say, in Mesoamerica. But we're just talking about the energy, the frequency, although it would be presumptuous to speculate on the Lord's actual reason for using the word fiery. Well, fiery is seraph. We got that last time. Seraph is fiery. So instead of just saying make a brazen uh, serpent, put it on a pole like the Christians read in the New International Version, it says to make a fiery, right? Make a fiery is to make a seraph, a burning one. To make a fiery. It doesn't say make a snake. <laughs> make. Here's a lexicon again. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery. And the fiery is a seraph, my nagi. <laughs> and of course, you know, the seraph is singing holy, holy. In Isaiah 6, you know, in the throne room of the Creator, holy, holy is Hawa. They put serpent in parentheses. It is a fire. It is a seraph from Sarah, the highest order of angels, right? It's a seraph. Make a fiery. Make a fire, make a seraph, make a burning one. And whoever gets the stinging, the biting, the stinging, gets healed. Whoever gets this healing breath, <laughs> this healing flame, don't kill you. It gives you life, these angels. So make you an angel, make you a seraph, make you a fiery highest order of angel fiery and whoever it breathes on you get life God
because when they say whoever it bites and you go to Strong's coordinates, 5391, not 5391A, 5391, they tried to trick us. A primitive root to strike with a sting. Got it. To strike with a sting, huh? A stinging like a flaming, fiery, burning one. So what's up with these? So what's up with this breath? that stings you and gives you life. You know, let's go back into the dragon lore. You know, now that we can see it, it's a biblical uh, relevance, you know, to the healing breath <laughs> with this Moses brazen serpent flow. Whoever it bites got life. Whoever the fiery stung, whoever was stung by the fire, God life. So they say it's presumptuous to speculate on the actual reason for using fiery. Maybe because whoever got that breath got life. That Ruach is also fire. Adam got that fiery. He got that Ruach. He got life, right? Eve got life. We can assume he wanted the serpent to be bold, bright, colorful in order to draw attention to this powerful symbol. Although the Lord did not specify what material to use, Moses constructed the serpent of brass. He said, make a fiery. Even though it would have been easier and faster to use cloth or wood, Brass may have been seen the best choice for portraying a fiery aspect. One can imagine the dramatic impact the gleaming brass dragon, copper dragon, had on suffering Israelites as Moses carried it aloft high above his head, the serpent flashing a myriad of piercing fiery colors when the sun shone above its numerous angles and crevices. And as we get until these metallic dragons for the dismount, talk copper dragon, brass dragon, and bronze dragon. Because if you're going to look into copper dragons, you might as well look into the bronze and the brass because that's how it's being translated, right? Brass, bronze. So they might put the attributes under the brass or the bronze or the copper that pertain to the dragon breath that heals, not kills, heals you, right? So this fiery breath gave them life. Let's look at these metallic dragons and, you know, some of these healing attributes of this dragon breath. One can imagine the dramatic impact the gleaming copper dragon had on these Israelites. Okay, as the sun was, as the sun was shining from numerous angles, such a spectacle would surely serve to remind the people of the fiery intensity of their snake bites. <laughs> or we're talking the dragon fire but not to kill, but to heal, right? Got you. As they looked upon it, they were healed. Not killed. Interestingly, the brazen serpent, or copper dragon, was kept by Israelites for some 500 years, during which time the sacred symbol was devalued. Now, this copper dragon can also be the green dragon because it's said that the copper dragon has these green tints to it. It could also be the rainbow dragon because of all the colors popping off as the sun is hitting it. So keep that in mind. We could be talking still rainbow dragon, kits a koala flow. We still could be talking green dragon, free phoenix, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, is the green dragon the copper dragon? Let's go. <laughs> so... The Israelites knew that the dragons had value, right? These are the guardian angels, man. Um, they just started to venerate these, uh, you know, as they started making these idols of these snakes or serpents or dragons 
as they fell out of their real consciousness, that's when they went off. That's when Hezekiah had to break in pieces the brazen serpent, right? Not the actual dragon Moses made, but what's being re reflected, what's being, uh, you know, kind of, you know, what they call it, just replicating, you know what I'm saying, from the real thing. These are replicates that's being worshipped 500 years later or whatnot. Because for 500 years, it was a sacred symbol. It's not a graven image until it starts being worshipped in place of the Creator. Because that's all they're holding on to is these miracles. You know, they'll look at the staff of Moses and say, we're going to worship the staff of Moses because it did these miracles. And they'll forget who gave the energy to the staff. You know what I'm saying? What energy was the original power, right? So that's when it becomes graven, when they get away from the Ama Abafo, the original power. Even though the Israelites were chosen people, they had lost sight of its meaning and spiritual symbolism had degenerated into worshiping the serpent as dragon's breath man from bellinghamuse.com okay <laughs> it's belly flopping man you know is there any connection with this dragon breath man <laughs> okay Get it bigger. The dragon is a powerful symbol that represents life, force, and great potency, right? This is why it was a great symbol for Israel because it represents life force, great potency. You don't worship it as a symbol. You worship the actual life force that is our creator <laughs> that is is being, you know what I'm saying, you know, all these things, you know, carry the essence of our framer and our shaper. If it comes through a man, if it comes through a dragon, you don't venerate the man or the dragon. You give all praise to the creator that has materialized that man, that woman, that, that dracon. You know what I'm saying? We're talking about life. Life. A why? So the dragon represents Hawa, it represents life force. This is why Psalms 18, Hawa's saving David with smoke out of his nostrils, fire out of his mouth. It's the life force that is saving Dawi. He prays to Hawa directly to tap into the life force that materializes as a dragon. <laughs> this is the is is the time to step into your power. Dragons also guard treasure. Right, right. The treasure that your garden, that your dragon guards may be your precious higher self. Like a guardian angel, right? In ancient times, it was thought that hidden in a cave guarded by a dragon lay a hoard of gold and jewels. The symbolism commonly represents the spiritual wisdom buried in the unconscious. The winged dragon is a powerful symbol of transcendence and can mean ascension to spiritual and mystical heights. The dragon's breath, hint, hint, wink, wink. We're talking Numbers 21, right? Make you this dragon, whoever it breathes on, with that fiery gets life. <laughs> so the dragon's breath is like the fire of purification. I'm just putting together a story of why it would make sense that Moses creates this dragon that Hawa says, hey, pop off, pop off and take care of the people since they don't want to be cursed no more. Whoever it bites or stings will get life. It doesn't make sense for a snake to bite you when you look at it and it give you life. But we are talking about the philosopher's venom. Right. If you see clearly, we're talking the alchemical dragon. 
that philosopher's venom is what they will call the snake bite. That gives you life, right? Because <laughs> it represents the vessel which the spirit is contained. Living spirit, life. It represents renewal. The, the venom represents renewal. And the venom represents renewal. Then the breath, my nine, represents what? Renewal. The fire. Purification. Think of the dragon as a powerful ally, ally that can help you to build up and contain your power. Use the dragon as a spirit guide, right? Guardian dragon, right? And its breath will strengthen your key. Your key, Managa, is your energy, your inner key. Ka? So it's not so much the dragon is something outside of you, like the Kundalini. It's the fire. It's rising. The dragon rises as you choose up. You keep the cold. It's the best way for a tribe to get that dragon fire. Because the tribe is in cold. We can share the same breath. We can be united in the same fire. We can be purified in the same fire, right? So, Numbers 21, whoever got that fire of purification got life. All right, so I keep checking the time. I really, <laughs> I don't want to hit uh, too too far over the two-hour mark. All right, so, um, as promised, my dog, as promised. But as we, you know, think about this breath, and I love these presses because now I'm so excited about Preston 115 because it's so much I didn't get to in these first two hours, but we're talking about the dragon breath. Now you think about the, the bronze, the brazen serpent, you know, think about the bronze dragon. All right. All right. Now we're talking metallic dragons, man. So, all right, you got the bronze dragon, which is a part of the race of what they call metallic dragons, right? We're back in the mythos, but Hey, there's a lot of drop in these metallic dragons. Love to the Templar. I <laughs> Templar, no. You know, you got gold, the silver, you know, all this. And all these are also in the game of Dungeons and Dragons, where they got the platonic solid dice. The dice are all shaped like platonic solids, right? So the interesting thing about the bronze dragon, or what they'll call the brave, is a serpent or brass snake in the New Testament or or the New International Version of Numbers 21. Um, the bronze dragon, right? Metallic dragon. Curious and inquisitive, they possess a strong sense of justice. Draco Garu's bronzo possesses a strong sense of justice. And did not tolerate any form of cruelty. So by the time you get to Numbers 21 and you got this dragon that's supposed to be there for justice, right? <laughs> to judge um, whoever, you know, looks at it, you know, <laughs> get that fire you know whoever gets that fire gets life that's a strong sense of justice right okay bronze dragon okay okay you got the bronze dragon i'm go quickly man because oh wait do we got some good stuff for 115 can't wait so there is small differences uh between the Bronze dragon and the copper dragon. No, no, I'll leave these for you. You can look up <laughs> what they say with the little differences. You know what I'm saying? They got manta like wings mottled with red and green discolorations. So, all these copper dragons got some green in there, some green tint. Kind of like that uh, turquoise flow that, you know, can also look coppery you know what i'm saying so there's a green and copper connection red copper connection as well you 
Uh, just looking at their attributes. All right, we got breath weapons, right? So you got that breath in Numbers 21 that's giving you life, that dragon breath. Now you got specific weapons that are breath weapons. Oh, look at this. <laughs> As fade away into the eyes, acquiring an appearance of glowing turquoise, my God. Huh? All right, so these dragons got breath, and the breath can be weapons, right? They got acid. <laughs> they also have a cone of gas that slowed anyone within slow motion. <laughs> okay. What does it got to do with healing or not? You know, surely if they can do that, they got other type of, uh, you know, ways to be benevolent and give another life, right? So, these metallic dragons, you know what I'm saying? Again, look at the Templar, got a whole drop on metallic dragons. Gold, silver, bronze, copper, brass, so... When they talk brazen serpent, right? You gotta look into the brass dragons. You gotta look into the copper dragons. You gotta look into the bronze dragons. <laughs> you know what I mean? And maybe that'll give us some clarity on numbers twenty-one, brazen serpent. Right? You got platinum dragons, steel dragons, iron dragons, mercury dragons. Okay, yeah, man. It's a frequency war. You better know what elements. Naga's coming in. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We touched on a lot of this before, man. Let's keep going. And again, one of my favorite books, especially when we talk drag and drop, that we'll pick up from here and uh, get a lot of drop out of this. You know, we're going to start. And just hop off as much as we can in 115 for sure, for sure. I love this connections they make in here. Um, you know what a dragonfly perspective. Return of the serpents of wisdom. By Mark Amaro Pink. Okay. Belly fly, Miss Belly fly. Belly fly with a knot. How y'all reeling? I know y'all. I know how y'all feeling. <laughs> but how y'all really reeling, no man. The water for surfing away with a god, man. And just let me know how much it means to you to get some of this drive and see clearly. Serpent or a dragon, right? <laughs> so they pop this off way back in Lemuria, angelic, extraterrestrial serpents. We're talking dragons. Whenever they say serpent, I'm saying dragon. Tired of saying serpent, and you thinking I'm talking about a snake. We're talking about primal dragons. Leading up to the commencement of the current 140,000 year cycle, angelic and extraterrestrial. Dragons of wisdom began arriving on Lemuria from many corners of the cosmos in order to participate in the creation of what was destined to be a divine paradise. To produce this earthly paradise, alien emissaries used their creative dragon powers to crystallize the shapes of Lemurian landscapes according to the divine mind's predetermined plan, all solidified from form, inherited the spiraling imprint. Of the primal drag, the spiraling, right? Khan, the nine code Khan, the Drakon, along with one or more of the beast's seven principles following the completion of their momentous work. Some of the creator gods and goddesses elected to remain on earth as protecting nature spirits, divas. 
for the duration of the cycle. Ah, this is when the worthy dragons were completed. Many extraterrestrial dragons landed on America in order to serve fledgling humankind as teachers or priest kings, right? Priest means president, king means John. <laughs> the media, hello, uh -oh. priest king, dragons, huh? <laughs> While acting as teachers of both the practical and spiritual arts to their adopted people, these dragons were a manifestation of the serpent on the tree or the Pacific Garden of Eden. Collectively, they and the angelic serpents are mentioned in many creation myths worldwide as the two, four, or seven immortal twin sons of the dragon goddess or solar spirit who arrived on earth as creators and culture bearers at the beginning of the current cycle of time. So this is many different cultural depictions of what they will call creator gods, right? But we're just talking frame or shape or flow. And, you know, everyone has their theories, right? So, and they got a chapter on cyclone, cyclopean service, okay? <laughs> they arrived near the beginning of 140,000 year cycle, uh, serve the people of Mu as teachers and priests, king or queen, okay? Maropis, Marus. First serpents, they keep saying first androgenies, you know what I'm saying? So we're going to dodge the thoughtism because this author likes to try to connect a lot to this thought. Always Atlantis and all that stuff. We already know this androgenies connects to their alchemical serpent. So we dodge that. So they're talking about this Mu and Kumar drop. Just going quickly. Their name Kumar reflects both their path to union as well as their inherent and androgynous nature. The syllable Ma represents the female principle or matter. The syllable Ra is the identifying sound of the male principle or spirit. And Ku is the sound of their union. As the androgynous serpent of wisdom, the syllable Ku combines the letter K in architect, an archetypal symbol and sound denoting both the serpent and the wisdom. So the K, the Ka, like Amaro Ka, according to the author, denotes the archetypal symbol of the dragon and wisdom in the Ka. And the Hu, or the Ha, the sound symbol of the creator's breath. Ain't that crazy? Because the ha, which they call who, is the breath in the Pictopaleo, fifth letter, breath or reveal, right? The ha. My wave surfers already know. So that can't be an accident. That the ha is the breath in pa Pictopaleo Hebrew is also what they're calling the creator's breath. And we just talked about that dragon breath. And the K or the Ka connects to the dragon of wisdom. Let's go. <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. So, it's a whole drop on Sedona. I'm telling you, we're going to take our time with this. Dodge all the hijacks, man. Arizona, all right. Come on. Now we're back in Arizona because of their, their auric sensitivities. Many Lemurians were fully aware of the Earth's etheric energy grid which is the dragon lines or ley lines they knew that the planet's dragon layers had the property of amplifying and purifying whatever was placed within the parameters so they consistently constructed their parks and temples directly over these power spots some of the more powerful vortexes thus chosen became the sites of the entire Lemurian holy cities one holy mecca for example was built over a huge dragon's lair in the area of what is now Sedona. <laughs> it 
and they put that Mecca in parentheses because we're just talking holy city. So before you put your Islam on us, we're just talking about holy cities. Upon the vortex of Sedona, which eventually became a colony of Moo, the Lemurians built numerous energy conductive temples and pyramids, which sounds a lot like what they call the Tartarian flow, right? All these uh, highly conductive buildings and all that stuff. The auric fields, the Tesla flow, right? Promoting spiritual growth and evolutionary development, which is why they had to change your grid because they can't have you spiritually growing and evolving like that. <laughs> nah. So we're going to catch up on this uh, return of the serpents or the dragons of wisdom flow. I'm belly flopping a foot of this mouth. We'll get back in this book. Searches for imaginary kingdom. The legend of the Presta. Talking that Karakatai flow. The Khan flow. They just say how the, how the K, the Ka represents this dragon. This Khan was a Karakatai. Karakatai. Cathay. India Superior. 13th century author is modernizing these car Katai Katan lived in certain hills which I pass. He went by one of these three passes between the western and internal parts of Middle Asia, between the Altai and the Tian Shan, and in the valley between these mountains lived a certain Nestorian pastor, oh, a powerful man holding sway over the people called Name. Belonging to the Nestorians, uh -oh. the region of the Karakatan Gurkha Yellow Dashi is described. So I'm going to take this back and get some of this Yellow Dashi flow because it goes deeper. On the death of Khan Khan, the Nestorian proclaimed himself a king, and the Nestorians called him King John. Right back to the who is Preston John Karakatan flow, and that's 11th century, 12th century as well. Surfing away with Preston John. Hey, who who is Yellow Dashi, man? Forty tribes, you know, they, they got into the Tangu. The Ok Oguz, three tribes, Bosmil, forty tribes, the Tangu, seven tribes. That's where they went to war, right? According to the Swords of the East, Genghis Khan and Preston John went to war in went to war in Tangu, which is what Canada, <laughs> you know, Upper North America, right? So, okay. Oh yeah, it's, this one gets real, real juicy with the Mongol flow. They get real good with the Mongol flow, John. The complete Dead Sea scrolls in English. Belly flopping to this spot here. That's talking about, uh, you know, these are some of the Qumran broken scrolls, you know, so we're trying to put them back together. A Moses or David Apocrypha, right? So as we make our dismount into some of the greatest uh, theories of all time, as we yawn and make a wake up stretch and stretch our mind bones into our theories and say is Moses David is Anna Jokbed mother of Miriam Anna mother of Miriam Jokbed <laughs> is that Hannah Lady Hannah wife of the Preston is uh Khan Kang Charles the fifth Holy Roman right so Here's another connection with Moses and David. They don't even know because of the similarities between Moses and David. Who wrote this scroll right here? Three small K4 fragments, which partly overlap. 2Q22, published by M. Balliet, B-A-I-L-L-E-T, represent a historical narrative of an unnamed speaker in the first person with the single actual name of Og, King of Bashan. Okay. Belliet and the editor, Eileen, 
Shuler wonder whether the narrator is David and the subject is his fight with Goliath, a theory based on a few verbal similarities to 1 Samuel, which cannot, however, easily account for the mention of Og, apart from his height, which was comparable to that of the giant Goliath. So is the same Og the same Goliath that David had to go against? And Moses had to go against Og? <laughs> David had to go against Goliath. Is it the same... Preston, right? Because <laughs> both Moses and David, based on this Marvel flow of Preston John, they both fit this description when you research that Moses was the king of Cush for 40 years. He's a king and a priest. He has a priesthood, you know, along with Aaron, man. So, you know, David, obviously king and priest. He's a Preston. He's anointed Khan. And he's anointed by uh, Samuel, who also has a mother, Hannah, just like Moses. It gets, it gets real crazy. <laughs> okay. As Talman, on the other hand, has argued that the topic of the fragment is more likely to be the defeat of Og by Moses, richly elaborated by the Targon, Mishwish, and Talman. So they're confused on whether it's Moses or David. Not just us, man. Not just us. All of his servants, Og, his height was. All those dots means that there's a there's a break in the scroll. And the half cubits, two cubits were his breath, a spear like a cedar, tree a shield like a tower, the nimble footed, he who removed them seven stadia, did not stand and I did not change. The Lord our God broke him. I prepared wounding slings together with bows and not blank blank for war to conquer 40 cities and to rout blank 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 so either that was Moses or David <laughs> sounds you know they got the og flow it might be Moshe you know but then you got these slings it might be David man then you got the prophecy of Joshua right <laughs> this is Joshua kicking that drop For behold, a son is born to Jesse, son of Perez, son of Judah. He is to take the rock of Zion, and from there he is to possess the Amorites, to build a house for Hawah, the power of Israel, gold and silver, blank, blank, blank. Cedars and cypress trees will he bring from Lebanon to build it, and the sons of blank, blank, and David, or Hawah and David, <laughs> the Lord will make him dwell in security the lord of heaven will reside with him forever but now the amorites are there and the canaanites blank blank inhabit whom i consider guilty whom i have not sought blank from you all right so look <laughs> you got a prophecy of joshua in the Qumran Dead Sea Scroll, he's prophesying about David returning to build the house for Hawa, the rock of Zion, son of Perez, born to Jesse, father of David. So why is Joshua prophesying about King David? What's the connection between Joshua and David? God. I mean, unless David is Moses and that's his own, you know what I mean? I'm just saying. <laughs> but some great apocrypha, you know, when we talk about Joshua and this David connection and this prophecy of David. He ain't prophesying about Jesus. This is the real Joshua. <laughs> He's prophesying about King David, man. Not a son of David. David, man. Moses was king of Cush for 40 years, man. So Moses took the city. I mean, Book of Jasher. Page 160 of the PDF pulled it up. So Moses took the city by his wisdom and the children of Cush placed him on the throne instead of King Kik Kilkianus of Cush and they placed the royal crown upon his head and they gave for him a wife, Adoniah, Cushite came, former wife of Kilkianus, 
and because Moses didn't want to, you know, um, have any babies with her, she had a plot uh, to dethrone him after 40 years. All right. And he got an honorable discharge because she said he's no real good shot. He doesn't want to have no babies with me. <laughs> so they said, all right, Moses, man, just you have to step down, but we love you, man. And that that's all before he was put in the dungeon for 10 years. Or actually right after that, he was put in a dungeon for 10 years. And that's all before he came out and saved Israel. All praise of why, right? That's after, you know, after that, he came out to free the tribe from Egypt, man. Went went head up with the Pharaoh. After being king of Kush for 40 years and being in a dungeon for 10 years and Zippor feeding him and he gets out the dungeon and then he pops off for Hawaii. He's about 60 something, 70 years old by that time. But Moses was king of Cush, therefore Moses did not turn his heart nor his eyes to the wife Kilkianus all the days he reigned over Cush. And Moses feared Hawa all his life, and Moses walked before Hawa in truth with all his heart and soul. So this is when he's being crowned king of Cush. We'll get back to it. <laughs> but just realize Moses it's a king, not just what they give you in the Bible, right? 40 years, King of Kush. Next time we'll get this document, Land of the Jewish Indians, how the Hebrew Bible made race and territory in the early United States by William or Matthew William Daughtry, Daughtry, D-O-U-G-H-E-R-T-Y. All right, I'm just letting you know what's coming. All right, this is... A drop I barely started looking into, but we're going to start digging on it. We got a brand new series, Mormons Digging Deeper. But before we do, we're going to dig even deeper, man, and get it, get some drop to set up for that series and get it going. It's a great document I found called Gatewood Farnsworth Debate on Mormonism. I'm going to leave a link so you can get ahead of me. Get ahead of me, my nigga, all right, because we just popping off, man. Hey. Kang the Conqueror, man, seemed to be bouncing in between the timelines on the quantum flow. They got him popping off in Ant-Man, right? Avengers flow. <laughs> Nathan's first foray in the 20th century under the Kang identity because he's jumping through the timelines, folks. Nathaniel tries to return to the 31st century. <laughs> he's all over the place but overshoots by a thousand years, discovering a war-torn earth that used advanced weapons they no longer understand. He finds it simple to conquer the planet, expanding his dominion throughout the galaxy, reinvents himself as king to conquer, or Holy Roman Emperor of Charles V, <laughs> or uh, Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan, you know? He seems to be bouncing all around the timelines, my dog. And it, it gives us, you know, is this technology real? Is the Sentimani Stone real? Is this time traveling drop for real, for real? Yeah, King is jumping all around the timelines, man. He's hijacking Preston John. After the Crusades, John travels the world until he finds the Isle of Avalon, right? He gains this technology called the evil eye, making him see clearly. <laughs> As a plague sweep seems to wipe out the citizens of Atlantis, Avalon, John prepares to sit upon a seat of survival, which replaces him in suspended animation. Again, back to the Moses flow. Now he's you know, his his eyes were never dim, right? <laughs> Life force was never lessened, right? Suspending animation. However, Kang appeared. Kang appeared, trying to get John to join him. As a result of the battle, John was sent into the past. So something about this time travel situation sent John into the past. First, he's in suspending animation. 
Now he's sent into the past. He attempted to manipulate events in the past, advising the Frankish kings to battle the Vikings. Uh, he was stopped by Thunderstrike. They're not in that store. <laughs> so there's a lot going on. Who was investigating a town king had reverted to a medieval town. I'm just saying it appears. He's all over the place. He even went to Africa, man. In suspended animation. John and the sea were later found in Africa by human torch. All right, which Africa, man? Which one, man? Clearly, they're saying they're around a bunch of Negroes, all right? While wandering in the desert, John found a tribe of Bedouins, B-E-D-O-U-I-N-S, and took the Stone of Power. And what's this got to do with the Sintamani Stone, my knife? This is a whole nother drop we're going to touch on next time, man. The Stone of Power, right? Great power. The stone of power is an object of great power. Come on, man. An object of great power. That was passed from generation to generation, man. We're talking about in the bloodline among the band of Bedouins who traveled somewhere in the Middle East. When this tribe discovered the mystic known as Preston John that came to worship him and gave him the stone as a gift. <laughs> Driven mad by the stone, he slew his followers, believing himself to be a master of the universe. Oh, man, so this drove him crazy. This untimely led to the clash against the heroes known as Thing and Iron Man. So they had to try to make Presidon go crazy, start slaying his followers so that they can come in. The Avengers can be the hero. I don't, I don't rock with that, man. I don't rock with that story. But there is a Sintamani stone, and there are stones of power. And you can recon more on Kang. We'll get some more on this Kang. But he keeps reinventing himself. Going a thousand years over here. 31st century, 20th century, uh, 11, 12th century is not out the picture, right? Right? 11, 12th century is not out the picture. Hmm. Things that make you go, hmm, right? Things that make you go, hmm, God. <laughs> Who are you, man? You pop all over the place in the timelines, God. Is this, is this gang's God? In the... 1500s now, 1200s, huh? Things that make you go, hmm, right, Kang? God, for the dismount. We're talking stones of power, Sintamani stones, best dismount of all time. Kang going crazy in the timelines. I leave this great list of books uh we got a lot of these as well at the drop library at 432thedrop.com and you know we're going through a great transition a great migration you know into more of a private server so shout out to my it magazine you can still access the website and the links uh the the menu can lead you to the library and the chat room as well if you have any issues getting on just let me know and i'll send you a more uh Direct link to what you need to access at 432 to drop.com. The water for your patience, my night is mad. Great list of books for you to dig on that have a lot to do with the Preston. A lot that we've never even seen before. Le Empire de los Preston John. Le Ethiopia. All kinds of good job. Land of Preston John. Yeah, we've dug on some of that before. Okay. Ah, uh, the Mongols and the Ten Lost Tribes by C.F. Beckman. That's a good one. Prisoners of Presta John talking about the Portuguese that are looking for the Presta that get they found they find him but he won't let him go. <laughs> so they call him prisoner. The Realm of Presta John by Robert Silverberg. So much drive about the Presta. We impressed at one fourteen, going on one fifteen, and we just getting started. There's so many books about Presta John. 
The priest king you never heard of, right? The priest Khan, they never told us about. Oh, who, oh, who is Prester John? The so-called black man that ain't popping up in your black history. Oh, you got to go deeper, copper color firing naga. But there's history about Prester John. <laughs> so we got a lot to do, right? We got a lot to do from the Marvel flow to the Mongo flow, right? This here is called the imaginary war between Preston John, Preston John and Eldad. Never heard of it. <laughs> we got to dig on it, right? I'm just saying, I'm over here belly flopping, finding new links and drop. And this is a good one that has a good preview to it. I wish we had time now, but I'm already over the two-hour mark. So we'll, we'll pick it up at 115. But, and this is going to lead to 116, 17, 18. Clearly, there's a lot happening. Because they're connecting to John, the San Banyan, Solomon Ben Eleazar, 10 Lost Tribes, Eldad. 12th century Europe, electrified by a letter addressed to Byzantine Emperor Emmanuel from a Christian king, so-called Preston John, living beyond Arab lands in a land of wonder and riches. Yeah. Among the nations subject to his rule are listed the ten lost tribes of Israel and their king, described by Eldad almost 300 years before. Is that right? So we have more witnesses Let's get the first paragraph toward the end of the ninth century. A strange looking traveler made an appearance in the Jewish community of Karawan, North Africa, today in North North Central Tunisia. Or are we talking Tennessee? Tunisia, Tennessee. <laughs> this Jew Eldad spoke only a strange and unfamiliar Hebrew and claimed to come from the lost tribe of Dan. He carried lost traditions and stories from the ten lost tribes of Israel living beyond the legendary river San Banyan, San Bachon, with their king and army. These accounts entrance Jewish communities worldwide and nurture legends that have persisted even until today about Preston John. Yeah, these are all about the accounts of Preston John, man. So I'm going crazy, having a good time, man. What about you? Are we enjoying? The Preston John investigation, my Naja. Are you not entertained? <laughs> we'll get to it. I'm just letting you know what's coming. Obviously, I can't even do all this for 115, but these links are enough to get us way through 120, right? We out of here, man. Remember this link as well. Come on. Another book, right? Another document, right? <laughs> we out of control with the Preston investigation. The issue with the Mongols, say it with me, Anatoly Fedomenko. This is going to connect so much of the secret Mongol history. Because again, great equals Mongolian. So when you hear Mongol, it's talking about the great, the great ones. And who's the great ones? Who are the Rus? We're talking Israel. And this is right here on the cusp of Genghis Khan taking the His name is also Georgie. So when you got Babylon in the kingdom of Georgia, you got this Georgie flow. Now you also got a, a righteous Georgies too. So not all Georgies are Genghis, but he is a Georgie. But he's also probably still in that title too. He's probably still in the George title too. Batu Khan, right? And they're connecting that with the Ivan, which sometimes they also connect with the John, the Ivan, the John. How he's still in the Johns, the Ivans, the Khans, the Genghises. All these are stolen title by Kang, <laughs> Genghis Khan. He wants to be a great one so bad. So this goes deep, man. In the, <laughs> in the Russian flow, the Tsar flow, the Ivan flow. Oh, man. The, the Varangians, the Varangian flow. We're going to take our time with it. Don't trip. Don't trip. 
Just know, just know. Oh boy, oh boy. Okay. Anatoly Fermenko. Thus, the great equals Mongol conquest had led to a formation of the empire whose center was in Russia, where the Anrus Monaga playing a key role in international trade. Okay. Mongol Empire had sold Russian slaves, yeah, Genghis, and they were selling Israelites. Because when they start talking about Mongolian, a lot of times they're talking about Genghis Khan. Not the real great, not the real Arab, <laughs> not the proper. The army of Russian, Mongolian equals great empire. So over and over again, they're letting us know. All right, all right, all right. It's too good. It's too good. Whoa. Mongols, great ones, right? You see, great ones, Mongols. Mongols equals the great ones, right? You see that? So this is what the great ones are, Israelites, all right? The Israelites are the great ones. Are the Rus, are the Khans, which is why the Mongol history is the Israelite history, my naga, is the indigenous American history of India Superior, my naga, Cathay, Kalelus. Oh man, okay, okay. Yeah, I want to talk that Varangian drop, but George, Georgie, Yori. Rorik, all oh, this is Genghis Khan. Khan. Titles, though. Titles. All right. We'll get back to all that, man. And obviously, we got a lot more Marvel quantum flow to connect and time travel flow to connect. I wanted to really go crazy stretching our minds, our mind bones with the quantum, man. But next time, man. Quantum mechanics differs from classical physics in that energy, momentum, angular momentum, and other quantities of a bound system are restricted to decrease, discrete values. Quantization. Objects have characteristics of both particles and wave. Wave particle duality. And there are limits to how accurately the value of a physical quantity can be predicted prior to its measurements given a complete set of initial conditions and is this how Kane is traveling time in his quantum mobile we're talking quantum information quantum technology quantum field theories ah the quantum flow of time right yeah see <laughs> marvel right <laughs> the quantum rim right Look at Ant Man, get that quantum rim drop. They're traveling through time. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they popped up, you know, around this Tacoom safe flow, you know, <laughs> jamming up noggins. Tacoom say the historical Israel Indian tragedy by George Jones. Remember that? Yeah, we'll, we'll be back. I'm just, Tacoom say isn't, they call it. <laughs> Israel, India. Yeah. Ka Ka. The Israel Indian connection. Belly flopping, man. Eh? Shakespeare's talking about and again this appears to be the last great you know what I'm saying priest king man priest con right here in America you know and he was trying to unite the tribes right here so they got they're calling it an Israel Indian tragedy man going against this Harrison in there 
<laughs> look at this man the lives of president harrison look at the small print and the indian israel indian chief to come say what it is the description and illusion illusion so they're calling it the israel indian chief to come say and this israelite right here at home was making the last stand of uniting the tribe of Israel. The Kumsay's War, 1811. Research that the Kumsay's comet or dragon, Napoleon comet, the dragon that was being seen, man. Seen, you know, what was to come. All the Shikamaga flow, all symbolizing what was happening. These were Israelites, and they were confederate against David. They were confederate against the Kum Say. Is David going to rule again? Well, Ezekiel 37, you know, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations where they have gone will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land and I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel and one king shall be king over them all and they shall no longer be two nations how many my nugget? one car not two not three this is written by multiple prophets Ezekiel Hosea Jeremiah we're reading it in Psalms 89, Zechariah 12. David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwell, and they shall dwell there. They, the children, children's children forever forever and my servant David my servant David shall be their car their prince forever who oh who let's press the job who got that water that fountain of youth that man sauce <laughs> yourself take the wheel who got that water Copper colored cons found here. Jose 3. Israel shall abide many days without a king or prince, without a sacrifice. But afterwards, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Creator and David your king. Multiple witnesses, man. Multiple witnesses. So we ask the big questions as we take this wake up stretch. <laughs> you might call it a stretch. We say it's right on time. Who is Anna? The same as Hannah. And it's Hannah. Whose name means favor, grace, and beauty. <laughs> the same as Jochbed. Jochbed. <laughs> Moses' mother in the Tanakh. Whose name means glory. So we're giving glory to the beauty of the Most High. And is that why there appears to be this joke bed, <laughs> joke bed on Hannah flow, and even a parallel, right? The joke bed and Hannah were felt to be parallel cases proven by the fact that Hannah too, like Joe Bet is said to have been 130 years of age when she conceived. Now we're talking Samuel. <laughs> and is this the same Hannah? As Lady Hannah. As the mother of Moshe, Miriam, and Aaron, Lady Hannah. Who in this case is the mother of David, 
saw Slade, wife of the president, Lady Ham. And next time we'll dig even deeper on this Tahama flow. And Princess Limbu of her body, Gotti Imani. You know, is this the hard hit we're looking for? <laughs> Daughter of Hannah or Miriam? Do we have a Miriam connection with the Princess Limbu of her body, Gotti Imani? Do we have a Limbu flow? Is that another connection? Is Rusadan? Oh, we could bring in the Armenian flow now. Is Rusadan also a wife of David, the fourth king of Georgia? Now we're bringing in the Princess Tamar flow back to the Uriel flow. <laughs> and you know how that story go. How that story go. And as they talk about David Sauslin, son of Lady Hannah or Anna, Mother of Miriam. And, you know, we'll get back, you know, again, you know, we got a lot to get back to. But <laughs> I told you it's going to take us well beyond Presto 120. It's going into these Nart sagas. And this Nart saga flow has everything to do with these heroes coming out the Caucasus. You know what I'm saying? And this Caucasus connection connects with the Kazaria flow as well. You know what I mean? Connects with the Russian flow. The Russia flow, right? Back to the Mongol flow, Ka, and the Sars Ruko, Rukio, Rikwa, and all this stuff, man. You know what I'm saying? Suslin to look menacing. Then we say the one with the daily glance to see clearly. And the name Sauslin literally connects to looking menacing, man. <laughs> I can't make it up. It also connects to he who is worthy, my naga. He who is worthy. He who has the look, right? To look, right? To see clearly. That look, right? The one with the deadly glance, man. You got that dragon. You got that fire. Who? Oh, who? Is Preston John. The Naga, this has been the 114th installment of the Preston John investigation. You got that look, you got that deadly glance, you got the evil eye, <laughs> you dropping on the, the, the timelines, you time traveling. <laughs> You popping out of a uh, suspending animation, man, with Kang in there, man. Hey, man, is Moses David, man? Is Hannah Anna Dogbed, man? And of course, you know, is Kong Charles V things to make you go, hmm, for sure, for sure. Hey, the water for surfing the wave, cons. Y'all, y'all noggers, man. You know, stay hijack free out there, man. Definitely believe in yourself. Rely on Hawa, and allow Hawa to reveal to you, you know, who to trust, man. Dodge those deceivers. They may come in the name of Hawa. They might come in the name of Drop Nation, man. Dodge the deceivers. Pray for discernment that mama can help you see clearly on the intentions of the people around you. Stay clear, man, because Nagas is hijacking and getting hijacked left and right. So we need the real ones, man, to, you know, make sure you are truly surfing the wave and becoming the water and high up in the ether, man. You got to be the Ethiopian, man. Love to natural by law because you are natural by law. Stay up, suit up, choose up, shallow.